If you're looking for visionary conversations that push the boundaries of everything you thought you knew, welcome to Conversations Beyond the Cutting Edge, where every month, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer invites two leading authorities from distinctly different fields to engage in a deep dialogue focusing on the latest discoveries, information, and insights on some of today's most provocative metaphysical topics. Here's your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. It's been said that the reality we have is the result of the consciousness we hold. As we observe our current reality with war, famine, genocide, and geological and geopolitical upheaval ruling the headlines, it's clear that humanity is at a major turning point of transformation in how life is experienced on planet Earth. With so many deep-seated, intersecting crises converging, it's all too easy to get lost in the avalanche of bad news and view all the crumbling structures as evidence that we're losing the game. But don't be fooled. For joining me today to share a more positive and far-reaching view of the extraordinary opportunities unfolding in the next few years as we wake up to the radical reality of a whole world view are two luminaries in their respective fields. Internationally acclaimed astrologer and author Pam Gregory, whose highly popular YouTube channel regularly receives hundreds of thousands of views, and cosmologist, planetary healer, futurist, and award-winning author and co-founder of Whole World View, Jude Carriven, PhD. Jude Carriven, Pam Gregory, welcome. Wonderful to be with you. Wonderful Good to have to you both with here. And thank you for joining us. Jude, if I can start with you, you have said that we have been living our lives on a worldview that is essentially back to front and that it's in periods like this when everything is shifting so rapidly that we have the greatest potential to shift to a higher being. Say more about that. Thank you. And again, I'm loving to be with, with the three of us. Um, Somebody, you know, said that this is the time where despite everything that is going on, as you say, Sandy, is this opportunity for us to wake up, to remember we're not separate, we're inseparable. And we're inseparable from what is now evidence-based, and we can explore some of this more fully, a living, loving and evolutionary universe where you know, everything has meaning and purpose. And so in that respect, I would actually say, rather than despite all the turmoil, I think it's because of the turmoil that we've come to this time because enough is enough. And perhaps if it wasn't as turbulent, I know Pam will speak more to this, but if it wasn't as turbulent as it is, Pam, I suspect that we would not be waking up from the dream of separation that's now become a nightmare. So, I'll come back later in terms of the, the evidence-based uh, across all scales of existence and numerous fields of research that can really ground us into what is ancient wisdom and indigenous wisdom, but is now moving forward with the discoveries and breakthroughs of leading edge science into this new perspective and this empowering and, and I think incredibly exciting opportunity for us as a species and as a species and together with our planetary home. So if it's because of and not in spite of, what is driving this? And Pam, I know astrology has a huge role in this, but, but there are so many components to it. It's easy, you know, for people like me, lay people to get lost. So can you add anything to that that will explain to us what is driving this? Yeah, it, and it's wonderful to share with you because I think Jude and I have, have similar views from very different perspectives, very different modalities and, and, and knowledge bases. But it's interesting. I was just talking to some friends yesterday who were sort of feeling the chaos and the overwhelm. And, and I actually said to them, look, if this wasn't happening, astrologers would be surprised. This is right on time for the astrology. And if we just take one particular piece of astrology, the, a big piece, which is Pluto moving into Aquarius, if I look back in history to, because it's got a 248-year cycle, very long cycle, 
If I look back to the 1200s, the 1500s, the late 1700s, always as Pluto was moving through those last few degrees of Capricorn in each case, there was a collapse of the old order. There was a challenge to the old power structures. And whether the old power structures were at that point, the church or an authoritarian monarchy, um, in, it doesn't matter what form they take. In today's world, you might have your own views about governments and corporations, institutions, but anything that is not for the highest good of the people is revealed in terms of corruption. And particularly when Pluto is moving through the last few degrees. And so right on time, right on time, Pluto moved back into Aquarius on the 20th of January. It will, it's now entering a 20 year transit, but it will dip back 2nd of September to 19th of November, back into the last degree of Capricorn. And that really is the final kind of wrecking ball, if you like, for the old order. And, um, in every case, and so it's almost a, a, an analogy I've used a lot is imagine that you're at a theatre and the theatre scenery is actually starting to collapse and the actors are speaking louder and louder so the audience don't actually notice that the theatre scenery is collapsing. But but inevitably, there's so much of the astro so much of the astrology that I can talk about at length. But I'll keep this simple for now: is um, that the old order is collapsing and those are the cosmic winds and it's a shift of power power from top-down vertical structures, unequal, elitist, rich people at the top telling poor people at the bottom what to do, the shift of power is going to be to the people. And it won't be handed on a plate. The people have to step into very peacefully into their own sovereignty, into their own sense of self, and really take that opportunity to shift the power back to the people. And, you know, if you like, later in this conversation, I can talk at length, particularly about the French Revolution and what happened um, to the socio-political and economic structure at that time, 1789 and beyond. But there was a whole shift in in the tax system, in the birth of a middle class, new enterprises starting. I mean, it was it was unknown <clears throat> socially. Um, so the shift of power to the people is inevitable. And it also depends how fully people grasp that opportunity through their own sense of sovereignty, if that makes sense, just to keep it really short. And it's very much a challenge to any abuse of power from a vertical top-down mm -hmm. system that is no longer serving us. Sandy, may I respond to that? That was brilliant. Mm. Thank Please you. Please do. Because I'd like to sort of set that. Yeah, absolutely. In, in an even sort of both a, a wider con context and a more intimate context, because what you're describing in astrological terms is essentially an ongoing evolutionary impulse of our entire universe. Yeah. That, you know, our universe exists meaningfully, evolves purposefully from simplicity to ever greater levels of complexity. So it embodies the very laws of physics, embody this incredible relational way, this beautifully, exquisitely fine-tuned way, which embodies this innate impulse to evolve. And of course, our whole universe does so, which means that our solar system does so, our solar family does so, which means our planetary home does so, which means that we do so as part of that ever wider sentience. So although it seems vast, it's also very intimate because that evolutionary impulse, the big breath as I talk of our universe, breathes through us in every moment. And what you just said there, Pam, about the late 1700s, I found really interesting because we see that these are not cycles per se, they're spirals because they move forward in time. So they embody that ongoing emergence. And going back to the late 1700s, what I particularly found interesting was although with Pluto moving into Aquarius then and a whole next step for humanity in the way we organize per se, nonetheless, the science then and the paradigm of science then was still of a mechanistic universe. Mm -hmm. And that paradigm really didn't shift. And it didn't shift through the 19th century. More and more mechanisms, more and more, you know, less meaning, less purpose, more mechanisms. And that, that drove the industrial revolutions and it drove the hierarchy, hierarchies that you're talking to. So now, with Pluto moving into Aquarius on this next spiraling, 
the hierarchies are dissolving at the same time that the evolutionary impulse is guiding us into that, you know, that that personal sovereignty, the, the me and the we and the all. But the other thing I love is that science is now joining the party and saying that old mechanistic perspective where we'd never be able to have this conversation about the sentience of our solar family and therefore the astrological influence. We could never have had that. We can now because the emergent cosmology is one of consciousness. So on a very basic level, what you're saying is that we are all part of this incredible, I mean, what, what is driving this? You know, what is driving the planets? What is behind that imperative to evolve? It is a kind of, uh, it's us. It's, it's all of it together acting together is that correct it's a whole universe it's hard hard to get your head around it, it is and it seems very vast yes to conceive that our universe literary mind and consciousness aren't something we have they're literally what we and the whole world are but when pam is doing this amazing work that she does at the solar system level the solar family level and perhaps we can even explore moving that out to galactic levels what this is doing is contextualizing that at the scale of our entire universe and because our universe didn't begin in chaos it began as the first moment of an ongoing big breath that vast big breath breathes through us with every breath we take so it's both huge and it's family and it's intimate and this is what I love about Pam's work, because that that bridging of that intimacy and the family, what I do is also bridge between that intimacy and our family and literally the whole world. So yeah, very thank much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. And, and what I love about Jude's work as well, and I got very excited the first time I heard you say this, Jude, and I've actually quoted you. You've probably heard my video several times that when you talk about the emergence of of matter from plasma and you talk about the flickering the mm -hmm. flickering of light that i thought was part of chaos theory but you said no it's part of systems theory if you could talk about that because i think that would be really helpful for people to understand how we how we create from the quantum soup as it were matter from from plasma be happy to. Well, first of all, to just have that sense that the appearance of our universe, its energy and its matter and its space and its time are real, but they're not the underlying underlying nature of reality. Their appearance arises from these deeper levels of cosmic intelligence and causation at every scale, from the most minute to our whole universe. So what we find is that in complex systems, which is what Pam's referring to, whether it's it's our human collective or an ecosystem or weather pattern, whatever it may be, but for all of that appearance of our world, underlying it are, are, are called holotropic attractors. It's a big name for something that's very fundamental and actually simple. Think of a basin, okay? A basin, you can put water into a basin. Well, think of our, the nature of reality and the appearance of our universe being underpinned by basins of consciousness and relationships and interdependence. Yeah? yeah. And in any basin, if you fill it with water and you, you sort of stir the water around a bit, okay, the water stays within the basin to a point. And then you stir it faster and it starts to slop over the edge. And then you stir it faster. It's all going all over the place. Well, systems... If they are stable, it's rather like the water in those basins are very, you know, there are very few ripples, there are a few. But the point is, we're at a point now where the underlying, underlying basin, that holotropic, holotropic attractor of our consciousness and what's happening is slopping over the edge mm. because it's changing so much, it is so turbulent. But what happens in evolution is that as one basin begins to break down because it can no longer hold within its area, other basins start to form. And these other basins are evolutionary. So they actually embody the potential for greater complexity. So just as single cells move to multi-cells, move to ours, move to ecosystems, each time in that evolutionary journey, 
there's been a process where the old has fallen away to enable the new to come forward at a higher level of complexity. But when that's actually happening, when the birth process of that is actually happening, that's what Pam's referring to as flickering. The old is dying, the new is forming, but neither are in stable configurations. And so the, 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 there's almost a bridging, a flickering into that potential of what is emerging, and then it falls back. It's a bit, I, I sometimes say it's like me trying to give up chocolate biscuits. <laughs> you know, there's, there's good intentions. I flicker to say no, and then I flicker back to say, oh, go on, one more. Yeah. But that's the process we're in, and that's why understanding the astrology of these times is so helpful because it's that 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 intelligence and that evolutionary impulse flowing through our whole solar family that's affecting our own collective and individual psyche as we move through what I think of as the birth canal of a new way of being. So well, how, how complex can it get? We're only beginning. I mean, I, I actually feel as a species, Pam, I'd love your view of this as well. I feel as we're a species, like I, I, I remember when I was three years, four years old and beginning school, didn't even know how to write, could just about read a little bit, joined up writing. Mm -mm. We're at the school gates of the cosmos. It seems to me this is the invitation of our universe to wake up and to remember who we are and who we can evolve to become as co-evolutionary partners, you know for our beloved planetary home guy with our beloved solar family and literally with our entire universe and on a very intimate and personal level. I love what you're saying, Jude, because essentially, as I understand it, you're saying chaos has the greatest potential to make an evolutionary leap because almost everything is freed up. It has the greatest potentiality yes. of a, a quantum jump as opposed to just a linear evolution. Absolutely. And Pam, you know, we now know from studies of complex systems that what appears to chaotic be chaotic has underlying order. There is yeah. an intention flowing through this. You know, the, the, the old, it's like shaking out. Yeah, you know, I can shake my hands, but they're still connected to my body. It's, mm -hmm. that, it's like the waves on the surface of the ocean are very turbulent, but the tides within the ocean are moving us forward. Beautiful. So it is so that is then it's incumbent on us as individuals to stay in coherence energetically as far as we are able to aid that whole cosmic process of this evolutionary leap. Because the Absolutely. more we are coherent, we are helping the yeah. the entire um, consciousness of the universe. Yes. Absolutely. And I love that word. And I don't know, I, I, I love words, as I think you both know. And I've been keeping an eye on what words are actually in the field at the moment. What words are people speaking to? And you just said, Pam, coherence. And that is coming forward time and time, more and more now. Because when we're coherent, I want to stress the unity of what we're speaking to, the wholeness of our universe, its innate wholeness and interdependence is not uniform. Its unity is expressed in diversity. So it's rather like the coherence of a piece of music. When everyone is playing their authentic note and we come together, we can co-create some wonderful evolutionary music together. But it does require each of us, as you say, and this is where, again, the astrology is so helpful, to actually embody our own coherence, to be our own authentic note, and from that inner being to express that in the outer doing and come together. And as another dear friend, Chloe Goodchild, talks to, to sing our hearts out yes. together. Because yeah. yeah. that's actually the Aquarian energy, recognizing your unique essence more distinctly and clearly, and what is your contribution to the, to the greater whole. That's very Aquarian. Um, and of course, we're going to have that energy very strongly, certainly with, with Pluto and Aquarius for the next 20 years and ongoing into the age of Aquarius. So yeah, it's, it's really beautiful. And it's very exciting because as you say, Jude, there are such strong, positive cosmic winds helping us in this evolution. And we really have to recognize that via the language of, of your own work and astrology and say, yeah, we are on it. We are absolutely surfing the waves. and We're going to get higher up the beach this time than we have ever been before. And, and looking at that with excitement and positivity rather than, you know, 
I love that. And Sandy, I don't know if you've ever, I, I'm a terrible surfer, but I'm a great admirer of surfers. And I've sat on beaches and watched surfers and windsurfers a number yes. of times. And what I love, and I think this again is such, such wise guidance perhaps for us, is they don't try and hang on to a wave. They're very present. They're in the here, mm. they're now, they're, they're flexible, you know, and, and I think that's such guidance for us. And again, the astrology, I'd love Pam to speak more to this, this sense of flexibility and this sense of, of literally attuning and aligning. Um, you know, we talk about going with the flow. I made an email error a while ago and I meant to say to someone, I wholeheartedly agree, let's go with the flow. And I actually wrote, it was late at night, glow with the flow. So I started <laughs> talking about glowing with the flow. <laughs> Yeah, Pam, I, yes, you know, the astrology, you know, the thing that fascinates me about astrology is it is such a, a great tool for us to interpret everything. But how did astrology come into being? <laughs> wow, well, that is such a big question because, you know, we we have understood up until around now that it's about 6,000 years old and it was it was born in ancient Mesopotamia, which was the birth of civilization. And that's when we, we didn't have obviously computers or cinemas and we were observing the stars and telling each other stories about the gods that lived on the different planets. And these stories are the myths that are the bread and butter of my day-to-day -day work. And, and Jude is an excellent astrologer too. So, and that has been our understanding, but I don't know if you followed really recently hot off the press, the work of um, Robert Edward Grant and his uh, recent visit at Christmas with a team of people to the, um, the pyramids of Giza and in the King's chamber, what he has uncovered. And it's absolutely startling because what he has done, it's really worth kind of blowing my fuses because what he perceived in the king's chamber um etched into the the walls were the zodiac signs aries taurus gemini cancer etc um and it is estimated that those pyramids are about twelve thousand years old not only that but at a different level he also saw etched in the stones the um the processional cycle which as you know jude moves backwards mm -hmm. you know we've been in aries then pisces and then into aquarius so the processional cycle of time moves backwards in time as it were as our regular zodiac signs as we know them in our day-to-day -day life moves forwards in linear time so this gets us into very big conversations about time but but also he is really dating as has perhaps graham hancock and robert Bouval. The fact that these pyramids are about 12,000 years old. So not only are the, the language wasn't written in Chinese or Spanish. It was written in the constellations in the king's chamber that seemed very important. Not only that, but if you look at the work of Robert Bouval, who had his best-selling Orion mystery book, it was only when he was flying above the pyramids that he saw the two larger ones and the smaller one offset. And he then realized they were a perfect mirror image of Orion the belt of Orion. And so th that's why the configuration on the ground, he felt was to mirror the belt of Orion. So not only does the actual building of the pyramids echo the galaxy, the belt of Orion, but the language inside the king's chamber is also saying the this was created by galactic beings mm -hmm. and we then said yeah, this is i'm so excited about this and mm -hmm. it, you know he then took another step in this interview and said well how did how how were these images etched in the stone because the stone is extremely hard and he felt that the stone at some point was liquid and just like Vader Austin's wonderful work thought of the constellations was imprinted by thought into the stones when they were liquid, but just last night, and tell her I'm so excited, just last night I was listening to an interview with John um, Stuart Reed, who was a sound scientist. Mm -hmm. And in 1997, he was talking about being again in the King's Chamber, playing particular sounds, and he had sand which he'd sprinkled on the um, sarcophagus. And normally that goes into beautiful symmetrical patterns, you know, somatics, which we know so well. But he said they were forming into Egyptian 
hieroglyphic letters, which are mm. not symmetrical. You know, they're not symmetrical at all. So either via sound, which Jude, I know you do beautifully in your book to talk about the creation of the universe from, from sound originally, and I'd love you to talk more about that, or Robert Edward Grant say thought imprinted into the stones when the stones were liquid. But either way, you're looking at edifices and therefore the study of astrology, which appears to be at least 2000 years old and came from the galactics as their language. That story that John Stuart Reed was talking about, um, I read a book by a guy called, I think, David Elkington, who was there when he was playing. And he said that the image that formed, um, he said it, it was the eye of God. Mm. And when he took a picture of it and he took it back to his archeology span teacher, um, she almost fainted because she said that, you know, now we've got the uh, origins of speech and language because the, the way that the sound the patterns that it makes became the hieroglyphics. So there's this whole connection here with sound. And we know there's a huge connection with light. And this is the bit that fascinates me. I think it is fascinating. I mean, I, I didn't know that, Pam. I mean, I know David Elkington and I know John Stuart Reed, uh, but I didn't know that latest perspective on, on uh, the, the King's Chamber. I'd love to hear more. I think we're on the, the, the beginning of so much as we remember who we really are and we remember our relationship that we are part of the vast communities of life throughout our entire universe. You know, we're really at the beginning of this. And I want to, I would love to see more and more of this. And it will, I know, Pam, with the astrology over the next couple of years, we'll just get more and more and more of this understanding coming out. So there's this beautiful birthing process of waking up to a, to a, to a to unified universe, waking up to a universe that is mindful and conscious, waking up to an evolutionary universe of which we are microcosmic co-creators, waking up to our human heritage and our extraterrestrial heritage. Mm. You know, this is such an amazing invitation, it seems to yes. me. Yes, and obviously, you know, if, if when we have contact, when we make contact with our galactic family, we then discover so much more because, I mean, it seems that others are way ahead of us. You know, we're just trailing behind and unraveling some of the clues that have been left. Absolutely. I mean, you know, when I was when I was doing my master's degree in physics at Oxford University back in the day, and I mean back in the day, um, you know, I'd already been walking between worlds since I was four years old. So I was very, you know, used to having communications and engagements multidimensionally and with extraterrestrial beings. I didn't speak about it there, but in the physics and astrophysics section that, that you know, I was part of, there was hardly any discussion of any forms of life beyond Earth. And I would say that out of 200 physics students, and I think we're six women, um, I suspect that less than 1% had any, you know, feeling that there might be. Fast forward to now, and we now realize from our studies of what's called exosystems, that there are more planets in our, in our galaxy than stars. We're finding more and more and more planets capable of, of nurturing biological organisms. You have to have a planet to have biological organisms. Interstellar dust clouds get us to that point, but you need planetary systems to take on that next level of complexity. So we now know that those interstellar clouds of gas and, and dust and ice have all the ingredients for more complex systems, more, more, more complex emergence and for biolog biological organisms, but it takes a planet. <laughs> you know, it takes a village to grow. It takes a planet <laughs> to basically nurture that level of complexity. But, you know, our planet, our Gaia, is, is wondrous, beautiful, water planet in a habitable zone of our solar system, the Goldilocks zone. But it looks as though both Mars and Venus were water planets to begin with. But one was too far away from our sun and too small. 
the other was too close and too hot. But now we're sending probes to the moons of Saturn and of Jupiter and discovering every chance that beneath their icy surfaces, there are oceans of water and, hab and, and you know, potential habitable for biology. But I know Pam, like I, and I like, like you, Sandy, we, deter we define life as the whole of the living universe. We're not just talking about biological life forms mm. here. We're mm. talking about, you know, the whole life sentience of our universe. But just to say, now, if you were to ask students at Oxford or any other university, do you think there's life? And by that, they would mean probably biological life beyond our Earth. And I would say 99% now, now would say yes. Mm. It's interesting how some of the remote viewers um, years ago when, you know, all of the remote viewing was going on, were talking about um, planets like Mars and Venus and no, and saying that there had been life there before. Mm. Yeah. And people thought they were crazy. I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it nice to get to this point and go, glad you arrived here. Yes. <laughs> I can't be on the same page here. <laughs> yeah. But isn't, you know, the, and this brings in, for me, the thought about water, because in my conversations with, with Fade Austin, um, it, it, it appears that, and I'd love to have your view on this as well, Jude, that some of the water on Earth is 4.5 billion years old from the very far galaxies, and stars are kind of uh, producing water all the time, which eventually comes down to us as rain, and we drink it, we ingest it, we it passes through us, and off it goes again, evaporates, and it's the great connector, as Veda says, perhaps not only of, of all humanity, so forget about race, forget about nationality, it's the great uniter, the great connector, but isn't it also the great connector of all life in the universe? Because it, it holds memory. And so it's got all the ancient knowledge of Atlantis and ancient Lemuria being carried in the water. That knowledge has not been lost. So it's accessible to us via... The, the water droplets around us and, uh, and through what we drink. We just have to kind of tune into it. So I don't know what your view yeah, on that. Ab absolutely. I'll go even further than that, Pam, but come back to water. Because in, in 2022, the Nobel Prize for Physics were given to three researchers who had been researching the what's called non-local wholeness or, or unity or unified reality of our universe for decades. And the idea that our universe as a whole is unified came out at the beginning, not just of ancient wisdom, of course, but came out of, of the pioneers of quantum physics because it was realized very early on that if quantum mechanics, if quantum physics was going to work at all, our entire universe had to be non-locally whole. Mm -hmm. And the fact that the 2022 Nobel Prize was given for this is settled science. We're not anymore, it's not contentious. It's settled science. And we found the evidence for this at, at all scales of existence. But going back to your point on water, when I was writing the story of Gaia or the story of Gaia actually wrote me, I was in wonder to, to realize, or it, it came really home to me, actually. I'd understood, it came home to me, that the hydrogen in our bodies is as old as the universe. Everything else that makes us up and Gaia up and our solar family up and is, is, is stardust, was born in stars. And as those stars, especially the largest ones, exploded as supernova, they exploded their elemental abundance into the interstellar medium. And over generations of stars, those became interstellar clouds of gas and dust and ice and i don't know if you have seen it but there's some beautiful photographs of the james webb telescope and one of them to google is interstellar cloud and you'll see this incredible cloud it's a brownish cloud but you can see its complexity and it has a boundary rather like a, a cell membrane between it and the, the the interstellar medium without such clouds but it's in those clouds these are the birthing places for planetary systems. Wow. So about five and a half billion years ago, a supernova, a nearby supernova, um, exploded. 
200, we think, million light years from us. We weren't there then. <laughs> we were just, we were just you know, possibilities in interstellar dust cloud. But a supernova exploded and the shock waves were perfect. They weren't too strong. They weren't too weak. What they did is they triggered a collapse of an area of a, an interstellar cloud that became a central protostar and surrounding uh, planets, possibilities of planets in harmonic orbits. That was our protoplanetary disk of our solar family. But all that water, those vast amounts of ice and huge amounts of what are called prebiotic molecules, in other words, complex molecules that are based on carbon that come to the edge of biology, but don't quite make it because the conditions just don't allow it. They were almost the birthing gifts from that cloud to the planets of our solar family. And especially where we are, because we're so perfectly positioned, those became the birthing gifts, the baptismal gifts for Gaia. So yes, a lot of the water in our bodies, in our oceans, the water, I mean, our hydrogen is as old as our universe. The water, yes, there was an analysis a few years ago to say at least half of the water is older than our sun, older right. than our solar family. I'm going to have to stop you there because we've gone past time for the break, but this is so fascinating. I don't want to stop. Uh, it's a great cliffhanger to uh, take a break on. So we're going to take a short break now. We'll be back with more from Jude Carrivan and Pam Gregory in a few moments. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Jude Carrivan, Pam Gregory. What a great cliffhanger that was. You know, as you're talking, I've got all these little explosions going on in my head of little pieces of information. And the nice thing about age is, you know, we've gathered a lot of information. When you were talking about water, it reminded me of Jacques Benveniste's work. And I remember watching a documentary in British television about 30 years ago about this and how he discovered that water had memory. And he ended up getting pilloried and thrown out and, uh, you know, dying as a, you know, somebody that was a persona non grata in the academic um, arena in France. So all of these little pieces that are slowly emerging, it's just, you know, it's like putting a big puzzle together. And, and, and what's exciting as well, and I, again, I'd love Jude's view on this. Um, and again, this was mentioned in the Robert Edward Grant interview, in which I'll send to both of you because it was amazing, um, is that uh, apparently Professor Brian Cox and that wonderful Japanese professor, Michu Kaku. Yeah, Kaku. Yeah, yeah. Michu Kaku. They both feel that the uh, red supergiant star Betelgeuse may actually explode into a supernova as early as this year, which would kind of link with a Jupiter Uranus conjunction, actually, yes. <laughs> one possibility from that. What's your What's your view on that, Jude? Uh, it's uh, highly likely. I mean, Betelgeuse is a, a red giant, so um, whether it would form a supernova, we're not sure. It could well do. Um, fortunately, he's far enough away. He's beyond what's called the kill zone, <laughs> which is just as okay. well. So, okay. but he could. But if he if that happened, he could be as bright in the sky for a short period of time as a full moon. It would be an extraordinary, an extraordinary event, uh, uh, you know, cosmological event. And it would be amazing if that correlated with some of these astrological, you know, thresholds that we're we're all moving through at the moment. Um, but yeah, just to, to add to Sandy's point on, on, on water, there's so much, you know, there's so much research now going into water and realizing that we've actually known very little. Its structure is extraordinary. Its ability to hold memory, its ability, you know, the, the very attributes of it, the fact, it sounds simple, but the fact that ice is lighter than liquid water is highly unusual in chemistry. But if it mm. wasn't, it would mean that when there was ice on top of a pond, that, it, you know, that the whole pond would be frozen otherwise. But it means that if it is cold, if ice is on top, life, biological life can still have a, a home. 
beneath that surface. I mean, it's quite extraordinary the way it, it sort of uh, it is also can carry so much, as you say, information, but act as a solvent in so many ways. Yeah, and it explains homeopathy. Yes, and the, but you need the susurration because yes. the susurration in homeopathy, again, helps to order the water and therefore hold the, the informational content. And, and what I found really interesting, and again, referring to Veda's work, she refers to water as God consciousness. And when she has taken, for instance, a sunflower seed and put a Petri dish of water over it for 30 seconds and then frozen to get the crystal, she doesn't get an image of the sunflower seed. She gets a crystal of the entire full blossom. Wow. So the water is reading the optimum potential of that seed. So that isn't just a mirror image response. No. No. It's a, a real form of consciousness and intelligence. So is it is it water, therefore, that is primary in in this whole evolutionary impulse? Is, I, is, God, is God coming from the water? No, I think God's in everything. I think God's everything. That's the point. Our universe literally is utterly mindful and conscious and sentient. But the beauty of it is the wholeness, it's wholeness, which I wrote a book called The Cosmic Hologram. Just as in a hologram, the wholeness of our universe of sentience is reflected and embodied in every part. So its sentience scales up and it scales down. Water, and I'm, I, I don't say just happens to be because nothing just happens to be, it's incredibly perfectly enabled to embody that in the ways it does to nurture planetary sentience, to nurture biological sentience. You know, as far as we know, there is no way in which we could have carbon-based biology without water. So it's, it's hugely important, but it took, it took nine billion years of evolution to go from that initiating hydrogen through generations of stars to interstellar gas clouds to water. Well, we are blessed to be here, aren't we? Ready for the next evolutionary leap. And, and again, I think that's very clearly signaled by the astrology in, in, in so many ways. I mean, one of the things that, that, I mean, there's so many things coming up over the next three years that are extraordinary in terms of endings and beginnings that I can talk about. But one thing in particular that sort of catches my attention is, um, is Uranus is starting to move next year into Gemini. Um, and it will do fully in um, in spring. I think it's April 2026 for another seven um, seven years in that sign. And Uranus is 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 the galactic, is the outsider, is the foreigner, is you know the distant one. But it comes to conjunct um, a very special dwarf planet called Sedna. Um, Sedna is just hovering end of Taurus, beginning of Gemini. And Sedna has an 11,400 year orbit and it, it orbits way out to the Oort cloud and back. And it's, it's coming to its closest point to the earth, which it will do in 2075. And that seems like a long way away, but actually it's dropping the bucket if you've got an 11,400 year orbit. And Sedna's myth is, as, as I'm sure you both know, is um, she was kind of, uh, taken by her father from this marriage of betrayal and he took her in a canoe to uh, take her back to the, the village where she was born and a big storm blew up and in order to save himself the father threw Sedna over the over out of the boat and she clung to the boat with her fingers and um, he chopped her fingers off to save himself so you know the patriarchy doesn't come too well out of this in terms of you know service to others but she drifted down to the deeps and she metamorphosed into beautiful sea creatures of whales and dolphins etc mm. so it wasn't just a transformation it was a total metamorphosis mm. and therefore when uranus comes to conjunct sedna i think that is, and it starts next year that is when we are going to really start to have a feeling of our metamorphosis into this new species, which is much more galactically connected than we have been. Does that make sense? I love that. And I, I've been saying for so long, for us to reframe what's often described as a crisis as mm. a metamorphosis, 
because this is exactly yes. what it's feeling like. And yes. I also, with that, Pam, you know, Uranus was discovered uh, at this time of, of, of revolution and, and so much. So this, I feel, is a revolution or revolution, revolution, not just in sort of scientific perspectives of the nature of reality, but in literally who we are, who we remember, who we really are. So it's it's far more than just, you know, the scientists seeing things in a new way. This is all of us, it seems to me, waking up and remembering and seeing ourselves and our role in the whole world in this beautiful, evolutionary, emergent way. Beautiful. And of course, Uranus is the plant of, of awakening. Exactly. That's mm. awakening, which is so great. And also the fact that, um, you know, as all astrologers did, anticipated that Pluto moving into Aquarius would, would bring up some very revolutionary energy, as it did in the late 1700s with the US Revolution, the French Revolution, etc. But looking at Europe with the farmers' revolution, what yes. are they rebelling about? Well, Uranus is in Taurus. So it's the land, the food, the agricultural system. It's so literal. I mean, it couldn't yes. be more literal. But that is going to lead to greater and greater awakening, particularly with the transits coming up this year, mm -hmm. to people thinking, boy, I am so much more as a powerful co-creator than what I've been led to believe through many lifetimes. And that's, that's the pivot point that we are at this year. Absolutely. And just going back to what you were saying earlier about Pluto, Again, something that's, you know, just been discovered is that, you know, for, for a long time, astronomers thought Pluto was, was a, a, what they would term a dead world. Mm -hmm. And what we're now seeing is there's evidence that there is biological life there. We're seeing that wow. even out as far as Pluto, there may be under the icy crust there may be that emergence of biological life. So I know we're, we will emphasize that we, it's a living universe in its entirety, but it's saying that the evolutionary impulse of our entire universe is flowing through in every way it can to continue that journey from simplicity to complexity and individuated self-awareness. So to begin, beginning to discover the possibility, the potential of this on Pluto. And from an astrological perspective, for Whoa. Pluto about life and death and rebirth. What yeah. a moment to discover the potential of life and rebirth as perfectly orchestrated, isn't it? Yes, it's mm. incredible. It's wonderful. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and also Pluto in Aquarius, I, I really see as understanding the mastery of our frequency. That's what we're challenged with, I think, in these times as individuals that we must really understand, you know, the two jaggedy lines of Aquarius, I very much see in one respect as energy and frequency and mm -hmm. us really getting a grip on what that means and how we move through our days with all of our, you know, negative self-talk and rumbles and jumbles, how we get a grip on that and become yeah. conscious of being conscious. And I that's see. our mastery. Uh, mm. You know, that's our mastery of how we, we, we get in charge of our frequency and we can change the world for free. Yes. Exactly. And, but how do, and how do we do it together? Yes. Because again, yes. of course, Aquarius is that, is that, you know, me and we and all. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And it has to be done together. Well, how can it not? I mean, you know, it's an orchestra. <laughs> you, exactly. you can't have one instrument playing. <laughs> it doesn't and, work. And as we look back in history, again, to those historical cycles of Pluto, it has always shifted from Capricorn into Aquarius, from, from the top-down structures, which are very unequal, to the grassroots up. Communities, collaborations, people coming together and saying, okay, how do we, how do we share together? How do we work together to maybe buy land, grow food, whatever it is, sharing ideas, that it's, it's bottom up, it's grassroots up linking together. And this is where we are headed, I think, and with a much greater understanding of indigenous wisdom, particularly yes. with the discovery of the, um, the dwarf plants, the Kuiper belt objects mm -hmm. that, that, that hold I think much, much more wisdom for us in a collective sense than we have ever known. Our bread and butter planets have been much more, I think, personality based, much more individually based. But now we are shifting to, you know, almost every single one of them has indigenous wisdom as part of their archetype. And that's what's really exciting. I love that. And also the evolutionary journey of the planetary 
sentience and, and archetypes themselves. They're not station, you know, they're, they are dynamic in their own evolutionary. So I love this sort of welcoming in to the extended family and a realization that we're all part of this evolutionary emergence, um, which, is, which is so powerful. I, I'd love to come back on what you just said though, Pam, because I'm sensing now, and this is where the, the hologram comes into, into play. It's both and. It might have been one way before, but now it seems to me it's like it's like multi levels. It's yeah. it's at every level, the grassroots, the the sort of the communities, the you know because it's it's almost playing out fractally. Well, it is playing out fractally, and also you know at, at the, the the sort of the leadership levels, but realizing that we're moving from the old paradigm of leadership into servant leadership which again is part of this me and we and all, mm. um, learning to learn together in these new ways, I just find it incredibly exciting. I mean, this is really changing our entire view of reality. Mm. Um, you know, has anyone put a time scale on this? I mean, I know time is collapsing too, but can we say it's going to take this number of years, you know, well, for... If I, just sort of from a humble astrological perspective, I mean, it's remarkable over the next three years that all of the outer planets, as you will know, are moving from um, heavy earth and water into air and fire. And you have to go back to the late 1700s um, when that happened before, when you had shifts of planets out of one sign, because they've all got very long orbits. But, so the fact that they are happening over the next three years is remarkable mathematically, astronomically. But in addition to that, and I haven't been able to find a time in history where also you had some of the dwarf planets changing mm -hmm. signs. Manwe has just changed sign into first couple of degrees of, um, of Aries. Homer has just shifted from Libra into Scorpio. Um, you've also got Sedna, as I said, end of Taurus moving into Gemini. She's got an 11,400 year orbit. So I haven't been able to find a time in history where you also have those shifts happening at the same time as our bread and butter mm -hmm. traditional planets. And um, the area that they're moving into is much more, as Jude was saying, multidimensional. Um, it's, it's air and particularly you know, Uranus moving into, into Gemini with Sedna, that is just going in all directions of communication and ideas and galactic connection, etc. And I mean, it's very interesting that um, May, June next year, we have five planets at what is called the, the Aries point, zero of the cardinals. Mm -hmm five planets and so that's that suggests that's a very big time for important shifts but then if we go into february 2026 you've got saturn and neptune literally kind of holding hands together going into zero degrees of aries the very first degree of the zodiac which is what i like to call the creator degree and at that from that point, you have six out of seven of the outer planetary pairs. You can pair up any of the outer planets to say, okay, when's the conjunction? And then you go into the waxing, blossoming phase. Six out of seven of the planetary pairs are in their waxing phase as we go, go forwards from February 2026. Now, that is remarkable. Mm -hmm. you, you just don't get that kind of maths happening. And if we look back to, you can have some beautiful aspects, 2026 to 2028, between Pluto and Uranus, you've got five trines. Again, you have to go back about 300 years to find when that happened before. It was a time of great um, uh, age of enlightenment, you know, great cultural blossoming. But also you've got Saturn Neptune, which is making real the dream or grounding the idealism in sextile to Pluto at that time. So, you know, those 2026, 20, 27, 28 are wonderful times of creativity, blossoming, you know, creativity in a way we, we can't even imagine that we've never known before. So I think over those years, by the time we get there, we are going to be in such a different place. But but this is the pivotal year, I think, 2024, because a lot of the old stuff will break down. Mm -hmm. We're smashing out the old kitchen cupboards before we can fit the new. And then as we start to, you know, as I understand it from Heather Ensworth, a good friend and a wonderful astrologer in the US, she is talking about um, 
the Kali Yoga cycle, how mm. we leave the Kali Yoga, Yoga, Yoga cycle in early 2025. And if you follow the work of Rory Duff, who's a brilliant geobiologist, I don't know if you come across his work, he's well worth it. He, uh -huh. is, he has tracked um, the energy lines of the earth for many, many years. And he is now saying that by the end of 2024, all of the Earth's energy lines are going to be in harmony for another 200 years of peace. So you've got, you know, a very um, lively, colourful, dynamic year in 2024. By the end, he is seeing 200 years of peace based on the Earth's energy lines. End of the, the Kali Yuga cycle, early 2025, and really green shoots of New Earth happening much more mm. obviously. And then some beautiful astrology happening from 26 through 28. And then we're, you know, well into New Earth and Golden Age and, and you know, all follows in terms of multidimensionality and our, our, our co-creative ability. I, I love that. And that wholeheartedly resonates with me. And that's my mm. understanding too. And I also want to add, it's our choice. Yes. It's yes. our choice yes. because we can still cling on to, going back to the surface, we can still cling on to the yeah. old paradigm, the illusion of separation and devolve into fear. But this is such an incredible, wonderful invitation it to is. take a leap into love, you know, and do yeah. so together. That's our choice. For so many people are, you know, especially younger parents are so afraid of what the future holds for their children. But, you know, they shouldn't be anxious. They should be excited. But, they, but I, I, I can understand why they are anxious, because mm -hmm. the appearance is of turbulence and turmoil. Yes. Yes. The media itself, the mainstream media, is so all-pervasive with that. And so I think it behoves you know, any and all of us who can serve this, this amazing, evidence-based, wisdom-founded, love-encouraging... <laughs> way forward to do so and to invite and encourage everyone to link up and lift up together because this really is as you say Pam I've gone back as far back as I can go and I've never seen a moment like this and nor should there be in a way if what we're picking up is yeah. is right you know this is an emergent yes. um, evolutionary move of our universe and so when pa Sandy you asked about timing and when I think Pam's given an amazing response to that and so, but for me, it's about attuning and aligning with this impulse and being in the here and now and serving it in whatever way we can and taking the next wise step together. Because as you say, Pam, we have really, it, it looks amazing. But I mean, can any of us imagine having a conversation today from a point when we were three or four years old? Mm. Well, I can't. No. no. No, yeah. no. And I love your idea of a revolution of love, Jude. Yes. Yeah. yeah. We've got to lock onto love as our docking station and make that our laser focus, I think. <laughs> Holding hands, joining hearts, and moving forwards together. Yeah. We absolutely do. So, And if you look at the children being born now, they are mm -hmm. genius quality, many of them. Mm -hmm. yes. Extraordinary. Absolutely. I want to, in our next episode, I want to go deeper into the children. But one thing I will share is that um, Susie Miller, who channels the collective consciousness of the children, um, has said that the children have been saying ever since she first started working with them that they, we, are the technology of love. That's it. Oh, Bottom beautiful. line. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Now, it's just amazing to see what is unfolding. And it's a very, very exciting time to be here. No pressure. <laughs> uh, one thing I want to ask you before we have to close, um, Pam, is how far forward does the ephemeris go? Oh, well, this one is 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 a century. You know, this is the this century. But they will, you know, they'll go on forever. But we are moving beyond, as I'm sure Jude will agree, linear time. You know, Robert Edward Grant's discovery of, I mean, every astrologer knows that the procession of the equinoxes goes backwards. But then, if you look at techniques in astrology like progressions, they are fractal or solar arcs. They are an organic unfoldment of time that isn't too tied to linear time. So I think we're going to make so many discoveries about time 
that just break out of this mold of 3D, you know, Saturn in Pisces is about the, the dissolution of linear time. And that's why people are having these odd experiences of time slippage and deja vu in a bigger way. So, you know, I don't think we even have the vocabulary for, for where we're going because it's going to be so different and so multidimensional. I think that's I think that's right. And I'd love to come back on our next session on this and explore it more in the multidimensionality. Yes. As a cosmologist, though, I have to point into a perspective that it's both and, I would say, that, you know, we can talk about our universe beginning 13.8 billion years ago and with a, a flow of time till now and all that we've talked about in terms of astrological changes, because within space time, there is an arrow of time within space time one moment follows the next and there is a pathway of causation and in our consciousness and in our locality we can connect with other notions of time what i've discovered though in 65 years of exploration is that none of those violate none of those violate that universal flow of time within space time what they do do is they open us up to the multidimensionality of the incredible sentience of our entire universe. On wow. that, we have to leave it, I'm afraid, ladies. I am so sorry to stop this conversation here because it truly is blowing my mind, but I probably need time to integrate it all. <laughs> Pam Gregory, Jude Carriven, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a joy. I've loved it. Thank Me you. Me too. You. Thank so, you, Sandy. Thank you, Pam. Episode two of this conversation will continue in two weeks' time. Um, and we don't have time to go into all of the details about how we end this show. So we will just say goodbye for now and see you in two weeks. <laughs>